So um, I'd like you to all remember a time where we were dropping off our kids, maybe. Um, maybe we were dropping them off at school or dropping them off to a sports event. And this child of ours, whether it's our own, our niece, a nephew, a cousin, a friend's child, they're all togged out. They're ready to go. And they're pretty excited. Maybe the child is only about eight years old, seven years old. And you know the way kids can be super excited. They're looking forward to joining their friends. You can kind of barely keep them strapped in in the back. When are we going to get there? They're impatient. They're excited. They've got a lot going on. But they're just looking forward to being with the friends, meeting with the friends. And you pull up and you secure the car. And you get around to open the door. Maybe the door is still on child lock. And your kid bounces out and just goes running off to join their friends. Maybe it's a sport event. And you can just see your little dear child merge into the crowd, merge into her team or her team, his team, merge into their team and disappear. It's quite astonishing how this this child that occupies so much of a space in your heart can just melt into the team, melt into the crowd. And then you see them maybe running around together. If it's a team sport, you can see them roughly playing some sort of positions, but sometimes they're running around as a mob. And maybe you just have just a simple differentiation between one team and another team. One is the red team and the other is the blue team. But pretty much all these kids are the same age, the same height, the same strength, wearing the same uniforms, maybe except one is red and one is blue and the blue are playing against the red. And you just join the crowd of supporters as a parent, as a caregiver, you just join in and you barrack for your team. You try to figure out which team your kid is in. I have to remind myself, oh, my kid's in the, the red team or the blue team. Because uh, we just, we end up just shouting for the kids. We're just shouting for our kid. We're shouting for our team. And we just join in with the parents and we try to figure out which which team are we on in the parent section? Am I in the red parents group or am I in the blue parents group? And throughout it all, our identity is shifting and changing. We're forming alliances. We're forming a group of people that we're in opposition to. And every now and again, we can maybe distinguish our own kid but just generally they're, they're part of that whole team, that whole community, that whole mob, that whole crowd. And we too are just part of our community, our team, our mob, our crowd. Just want to breathe into that space. Maybe just replay slightly that moment when the child that I care for, that little bundle of joy that has been bouncing around the back seat of the car just merges into the crowd, merges into the team, merges into her mates. Similarly, if I look at the different parts of my own body, scanning from the top of my head down, from my head to my feet, 
I can see the top of my head. I don't have to visualize it or distinctly know it. It's just I know it's there. I'm putting my attention in that direction. So I can see the top of my head. So this top of my head that is unique, wonderful and special, but it too is part of a greater whole, a greater body, a greater community. And the back of my head is unique, wonderful and special. No other part of the body is exactly like it, but it too is just part of this greater whole, part of this greater body, part of this greater team, this greater community. And the right side of my head is unique, wonderful and special. No other part of the body is exactly like it. The right part of side of my head is, is able to listen and hear. But it too is part of this greater community, part of this greater whole, part of this greater body. And the left side of my head is unique, wonderful and special. It's similar to the right side of the head, but it's not identical, it's not a twin. It, it's similar, it's, but not the same, it's not identical. The left side of my head is unique, wonderful and special, but it too is part of this greater whole, part of this greater community. My forehead, the front of my head, is unique, wonderful and special. No other part of the body is exactly like it. My forehead is unique, wonderful and special, but it too is part of this greater team, part of this greater whole, part of this greater community. My eyes are unique, wonderful and special. They're gift of sight, vision, how I look and see the world. Unique, wonderful and special ability of my eyes but they too are just part of this greater community, part of this greater whole, part of this greater body. My nose has this ability to smell, draw air into the body, cleaning the air. My nose is unique, wonderful and special, but it too is part of this greater community, part of this greater whole, part of this greater body. My mouth is unique, wonderful and special. It can chew, it can smile, it can talk. It can taste the food. My mouth is unique, wonderful and special. But it too is part of this greater community, part of this greater whole, part of this greater team. My neck is unique, wonderful and special has the esophagus, the thyroid. It can rotate at least 180 degrees. It can look up and down. An amazing degree of freedom and movement in my neck. My neck is unique, wonderful and special. No other part of the body can do exactly as the neck can do. But it too is part of a greater community, part of a greater whole. My shoulders are unique, wonderful and special. Left shoulder and right shoulder are not the same as each other. My shoulders are unique, wonderful and special. I give them full permission to let go of the weight, the burden of shopping that I may have been carrying, putting down my luggage, putting down any tension or stress that may be in my shoulders any regrets about the past, any anxiety about the future. I give full permission to my shoulders to let go of their burdens. My shoulders are unique, wonderful and special. No other part of the body carries these burdens like my shoulders. But my shoulders are part of a greater community, part of a greater whole. My arms are unique, wonderful and special. With my arms I can hug and embrace. I can carry the load. 
My arms are of great strength and support in my life, helping me, supporting my well-being. My arms are unique, wonderful and special, but they too are part of a greater community, part of a greater whole. My hands, fingers, palms, unique, wonderful and special, worthy of great respect for their dexterity, ability, how they can clean, feed, take care of, write, build, make, create, so many things I can do with the ability of my hands, but though my hands are unique, wonderful and special, they too are part of a greater community, part of a greater whole. My lungs are unique, wonderful and special. No other part of the body is so well adapted for bringing air in and expelling My lungs are unique, wonderful, and special, <coughs> breathing in and breathing out. Unique, wonderful, and special, but still part of a greater community, part of a greater whole, part of a greater body. My heart is unique, wonderful, and special, supporting my well-being and happiness from so very early in my development all the way to the last moment. My heart is unique, wonderful and special. But it too is part of a greater community, part of a greater whole, interconnected, interbeing, inter are. My stomach and intestines are unique, wonderful and special. No other part of the body can absorb the nutrition and the food so bringing it in, drawing it in, and expelling the toxicity out of the body. The stomach and intestines are unique, wonderful, and special. But they too are just part of a greater community, part of a greater whole, part of a greater body. My back and spine, upper back, middle back, lower back, radiating ribs and spinal cord are unique, wonderful, and special supporting me, keeping me upright, giving some form and stability to my whole body. Without my back and spine, I would be like a jellyfish. My back and spine is unique, wonderful and special. <coughs> but it too is part of a greater community, part of a greater whole. My pelvis and hips are unique, wonderful and special. They're great strength, rigidity, empowers my body, gives a great foundation for the whole body. Pelvis and hips are unique, wonderful and special. But they too are also part of a whole, part of a greater community, part of the team. <coughs> My thighs are unique, wonderful and special. Their great power and strength enables me to be stand, lift, walk, move around, sit down, swim, dance, everything. Thighs are unique, wonderful and special. Their power and their strength. But they too are also part of a greater team, a greater whole, a greater community. My knees are unique, wonderful and special, their ability to bend and flex, carry the weight and the strain. My, thigh, my knees are unique, wonderful and special, but they too are part of a greater community, part of greater whole. My shin and calf is unique, wonderful and special. I enjoy the spring in their step especially in the spring weather. Shin and calves are unique, wonderful and special. But they too are also part of a greater community, part of a greater whole, part of a greater team, a greater organization, the interbeing, the inter are. My feet heal 
ankle, foot, toes, all unique, wonderful, and special. My feet connect me with the earth, keep me standing upright, give me balance, so many things. My feet are unique, wonderful, and special. They interbeing, they inter are, they interconnect me with the whole world. But they too are part of a greater community, part of a greater whole, part of a greater. So putting all this body and mind together, these feet, legs, torso, arms, neck, and head, this body and mind of mind, so many different parts coming together like a team, a community, all these different members of the team where the sum is in many ways greater than the whole. This body and mind of mine is unique, wonderful and special. But it too is just part of a greater community, part of a greater whole. This whole body and mind is interdependent, interbeing, inter are. So as I turn my attention, radiating it out wider and wider from my body like ripples in a pond, or like the light of a candle at night, Everyone in this room is unique, wonderful, and special. No one in this room is identical or the same as someone else. We're all unique, wonderful, and special. But we too are all part of this community, part of this greater whole. Members of this gathering today, members of the BSV, This group gathered here today are unique, wonderful, and special as a group. We're unique, wonderful, and special as individuals. But we are also part of a greater whole, part of a greater city, part of a greater community. Unique, wonderful, and special, but still part of something greater and whole. This city of Melbourne, made up of so many parts, so many people, so many beings. Together, the city of Melbourne is unique, wonderful, and special. But it too is part of a greater team, part of a greater whole, part of a greater entity. This whole continent of Australia is unique, wonderful, and special. This Red Island, so many unique, wonderful, and special characteristics. The marsupials, the land, the red color, the native bush. Unique, wonderful, and special, but still part of a greater whole, greater community, a greater interbeing and inter are our neighbors surrounding us New Zealand Indonesia each place unique wonderful and special the people the vegetation everything is unique wonderful and special in, in New Zealand and Indonesia but even our neighbors are also part of something greater something connected to a greater team, a greater community, a greater interbeing, inter are, interconnected. Southeast Asia, so we spread wider and wider from the Philippines across to Malaysia, continuing up through Singapore, Thailand, Burma, Lao, Cambodia, this whole region, unique, wonderful, and special in every way. Everywhere, any aspect of it we look at is unique and wonderful and special. But it too is just part of a greater community, part of a greater whole, part of a greater team. If we move following the sun, we're going to go west, 
We come to South Asia, to India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, this whole region, unique, wonderful, and special. Any of us who've been there can acknowledge how unique and wonderful and special this whole region is. But it too is part of a greater community, part of a greater team, part of this greater planet. South Asia is unique, wonderful, and special, but it too is part of this, this greater community. The whole Middle East is unique, wonderful, and special from Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Yemen. This whole region is unique, wonderful, and special. But it too is interconnected, interbeing, inter are. It too is part of a greater team. It has its place in the web of life on this planet Earth. The Arabic Peninsula, the whole of Africa, Egypt to Morocco to South Africa, the whole continent, again, so many unique and wonderful aspects to this whole region, great history, culture, food, dance, animals, plants. This whole region of Africa is unique, wonderful, and special but it too is part of this greater community, part of this interbeing, inter our. Europe is unique, wonderful, and special from the boot of Italy to Scandinavia, from Portugal to Turkey, from Russia to Ireland, unique, wonderful, and special. This whole region of Europe, everywhere we go in there is unique, wonderful, and special. But it too is part of a greater community, part of a greater whole, interbeing and inter are interconnected. We move across to the Americas, South America, Central America, North America. Unique, wonderful, and special. Each region, each area is unique, wonderful, and special. The whole of the Americas is unique, wonderful, and special. But it too is also interconnected, interbeing, inter are. Finally, we move across the Far East to China, Vietnam, Korea, Mongolia, Tibet, this whole region, unique, wonderful, and special. No other part of the world is like it. No other part is identical to this region. Languages, cultures, people, history, geological features, weather, everything unique, wonderful, and special. But it too is part of this greater world, this greater planet, this interbeing, this inter are, this interconnectedness that exists in this region too. This whole planet Earth, if we can see it as a globe, we can see it as a like a round ball, mostly water, large areas of the continents great islands like Australia, polar caps, clouds, rivers, lakes, different colors of landmass, a tapestry of color, of lights. This whole planet Earth is unique, wonderful, and special. But it, sh it too is also part of uh, its own ecosystem, it's part of its own. It is too, is interconnected, interbeing, inter are. It too is just part of one of the planets in the solar system. And the solar system is just one little solar system in the galaxy of the Milky Way. And this galaxy of the Milky Way is just another of the billions of galaxies that exist in the world, or this universe around us. So this planet Earth is unique, wonderful, and special. But it too is interbeing, interconnected, inter are, interrelated with this whole world around us. 
So let's just walk over to where the sun is, sitting in the middle of our solar system. I like to imagine the sun as a kind of a sofa, somewhere comfortable, somewhere safe, somewhere secure in the center of the solar system. And I like to take this place in the, in the world so I can survey and radiate in all directions a great appreciation that no matter where I look and see, north, south, east, west, above and below, I can see things that are unique, wonderful and special. But they too are also part of this greater whole, this greater interconnectedness, this greater interbeing, inter r this greater community. Each breath going in and out. So taking this safe place in the center of the solar system, I can just feel the breath going in and out in my abdomen or in my chest or out my nose, bringing my attention to each breath going in and out. Each breath is unique, wonderful and special. Rising, present, passing away, each breath unique, wonderful and special. But this, this breath and this breathing is just part of a whole continuum of breaths and breathing that have been sustaining this life and connecting me with all beings all around, interconnecting, interbeing, inter r with all beings in all directions all around me. Just as they breathe in and breathe out, so too do I breathe in and breathe out. Just as there are hairs on the top of my head, there are maybe hairs on the top of their head. Just as I have thoughts and feelings, they too have thoughts and feelings maybe in all around. Just as I have a qualia or a conscience or a sense of Vedana, like or dislike, or neither like nor dislike, they too may have these qualities of mind. Just as I see truth, maybe they see truth too. So all around us, we interbeing, inter are interconnected. But we can just bring our focus of attention to our own breathing. And as we sink deeper and deeper into the breath, as we perceive it, we can see that every aspect of the breath is unique, wonderful, and special. No two breaths are exactly alike, constantly changing, changing in tension, changing in presence, changing in release. how I experience it, how I perceive it, constantly changing in every moment. Not a gross change, subtle change, but as I sink deeper and deeper into the breath, I can see that no two moments, no two aspects of any breath are identical or the same. So the breath superficially looks just the same, no difference, but in detail, it's constantly dynamic and changing. Just as this whole city around us breathes, we have the same streets and buildings, but everything is constantly changing in detail. Fascinating, beautiful in its own way. The nature of the breath is fascinating and beautiful. Fascinating to a mind that takes an interest, an attentive mind, a mindful mind, an aware mind, a conscious mind, giving conscience to this sensation of touch that we call the breathing in and breathing out. And I bring my mind in contact with the breath, with the touch, the touching of the air with 
the experience of the breath going in and out, the stiffness and tension that rises and then decays away in each cycle of breathing. Tension is increasing, present, and then passes away. But when we look in detail, we can see that there are smaller and smaller units of tension and passing away, tension and passing away as it increases and increases and then it decays away. Each breath, each cycle of breath, there is a birth, a presence and a passing away. There is birth, aging and death in every breath, in every moment of breathing, in and out. There is this interconnection, interbeing, inter are, and yet this paradox that each moment, each unit is unique, wonderful and special in this breathing. So as I bring my mind and my body together with this focus on the breath, breathing in and out, the boundaries of mind and body are melding and bringing together. Just as a body has a shadow in the, the light of attention, so this mind and body perform a beautiful dance together in unity, in attention and awareness on the breath in detail. And we can see in each moment coming into being, presence and passing away, birth, old age, sickness and death. Coming into being, presence, passing away in every moment and every breath. Connection between the self and the world in every breath. Unique, wonderful and special, but yet part of a whole lifetime of breathing in and breathing out. This interconnection, been interbeing, inter are. We can see that the Boundaries between different categories dissolve in detail. Breathing in and breathing out dissolves. The difference or the exact separation between self and the world dissolves. So this, this breathing in and out is unique, wonderful and special. But it too is just part of a greater community, part of a greater whole, part of a greater world. It is interbeing, inter are, interconnected, but it too is also unique, wonderful and special.
So as I start to come to the end of this practice, I, <clears throat> I reflect upon my mind, on the state and condition of my heart. How does this feel? Is this space in my heart a safe place? Is this, what is the tone? What is the ambience? Sometimes we walk into a building or into a, a space, into a restaurant or something like that, and we, we consider the tone and the ambience. Does this feel safe? Does this feel like a kind place? Does this feel like a, a welcoming place? Is this comfortable? Is this a good fit? So checking in with these very, very important sensations or feelings in the, the heart. Sometimes we just need to know the direction, a sense that this is a good place to be. Is this going from darkness to brightness? Or is this going from bright to brighter? Or is it going from bright to dark or dark to darker? How is this space in my heart? Is this place sinking or rising up? Is this space freeing, liberating, liberating? Or is it impinging and squeezing in on, on this heart of mine? Is this a comfortable place for my heart to be? Is this a kind place? Is this caring? Is this nurturing? Or is it depleted? Draining? Is this a heart that is aware? Is this an investigative heart? Is this an energetic heart? Or is it dull, disinterested, and depleted? Is this a joyous heart? Is this a peaceful heart? Is this a calm and tranquil heart? Is this an equanimous heart? Or is it agitated, unhappy, not peaceful, disturbed, unbalanced and unhinged? What is the nature of this space in my heart? Is this a place I can remember how to find again? Is this a secure shelter from the great winds that blow from all directions? Is this a safe shelter for my heart to exist and be in? So in life there are great winds that blow, winds like fame and defame, winds like wealth and gain or loss. There are so many different kinds of winds and forces that are blowing in our life. We can have health or we can have disease. We can have different kinds of prosperity. So the nice word they use in English for this is vicissitudes, up and down, rising and falling. <clears throat> but it's the nature of the world. As long as we're in the world, there will be winds blowing. This is the nature of samsara. And these forces are driven by causes and conditions. So the Buddha always pointed back to causes and conditions, it gets down to the heart of Buddhism. So
So the Four Noble Truths are a whole sequence of causes and conditions. So there is suffering. Why? Because of craving. Is there a solution? Yes. Nibbana, the extinguishment of suffering. Is there a way out? Is there a prescription to this? Yes, the Eightfold Noble Path. So this is kind of a logical sequence. Because of suffering, why? Causes and conditions, tanha, craving. Is there a solution? Is there an effect that would be desirable? Yes, nibbana. Is there a way and means to that effect? Yes, the, the Eightfold Noble Path, a prescription, a way, a medicine. Paticca Samupada, dependent origination, because of birth, old age, sickness and death. The problem isn't death, the problem is birth, the cause. Death is a consequence, it's not a cause. Birth is a cause. It's very interesting how the Buddha just always comes back to causes and effects. So he has a very shorthand way of describing this. He says, because of this, that. Sometimes you'll see this frequently across the suttas, very shorthand. Because of this, that. Because of this, that. Because of breathing in, breathing out. You can just see it. And in the breath, and you break down each moment of the breathing in, you can if you are attentive enough, you can see that there are sub-tensions and releasing, releasings going on. It gets down to really like sub-micron or sub-millisecond detail, you can see. So what looks like a long breathing in and a long exhalation is in fact millions and millions of breathing ins and breathings out in great detail. The mind is so fast. It looks like we're thinking, oh, I'm going to do this, and then we do it, and then it's done. But along the way, there's just millions and millions of thoughts. In any action we do, we move our hand. Millions and millions of movements. I was reading uh, in the newspaper about a doctor who specializes in robotic arms. He said there's 14 degrees of movement in your arm. He said a very complicated thing to try to make a, ro a robotic arm. Then connect that robotic arm by a wire into one's brain. Very complicated to do that. So when we look into our own body, just like we did in this my sweeping through our mind, through the body, like we did earlier on, very complicated, all these different parts, how they all work together. So we can think about things like biodynamic movement in the body. So how all the different mechanical parts of our body interact, very complicated. If you talk to a physiotherapist about the gait and the movement of a walk, posture, stability, Sometimes you go to a hospital and there's so many different specialists. Right now I'm going to see a knee specialist. Knee. That's his job. Knees. He does a bit on hips. That's it. Don't ask him about ears. Noses. Eyes. Hair. Skin. Voice box. Mm -hmm. Different department. Different person. Yet all of these parts work together in the body. The mind, even far more complicated. One of my old teachers, Syadu Kundala, once said to me, the mind is strange. He meant it strange as in a mystery, as something almost unfathomable, our mind. 
sometimes I read about Silicon Valley's latest thing on AI or something like that, how they're going to crack the mind and solve it and have some silicon version and it'll be all better. Good luck. Consciousness, they have no clue. They don't know where it is, what it is, what it looks like. Is it in the body? Is it in the mind? Is it this? Is it that? But we're going to have a robot that's going to be even more conscious than us. Good luck. Maybe the internet is conscious. Good luck. So, but we can see that connecting all of these things are causes and conditions. And with the right causes and conditions in place, we can get the skillful effects. It's very deluded to think that I can have the special causes without putting in the special effects. I can have what I want, but I don't put in the causes and conditions. It's really magical thinking. It's like being a little three-year-old and you go into the lottery shop and you buy a ticket, your, your granddad or your, your mom or dad buy you a ticket and you go, so when am I going to win? Well, maybe you have a, a chance. It's, but it's magical thinking to be very hurt and disappointed that you don't win the lottery because you have one ticket. It's not an adequate cause and condition to win the lottery. You need many tickets to win a lottery if you want to be absolutely sure. And even then you can still lose, unless you own all the tickets in the lottery. Or all the combinations, anyway. And even then you might have to share your prize. So we need to look very carefully into the causes and conditions that we're putting into our life. If we don't like the effects, start changing the causes and conditions. If something isn't working in your life, try to cool down, calm down, and cast your mind back and see and review what were the causes and conditions that I put in that now I'm experiencing these effects in my life. Somebody fails an exam. What were the causes and conditions? Can I review? Did I study? Were my teachers clear? Did they go over the curriculum with me? Did I understand the questions? Had I put in the work? Had I shown up for the right exam? Was I there on time? Did I miss it? Was I prepared? Was I sick? With there's causes and conditions at play in everything, and it's really magical thinking to think that there was no cause or condition. Mystery. Complete mystery. I have no idea. No, it just it was unfair. Well, life is fair. People always come and ask me about karma. They'll say karma. That means bad. Karma doesn't mean bad. It's like saying cause, I said to you, cause and condition. Cause and condition. Obviously it doesn't mean bad, right? But when we say karma, which means cause and condition, it's like, oh, it must be bad. And we want the lucky, lucky result. How can I be lucky? Meaning some magical thinking around causes and conditions. So sometimes we have to put in the hard work. Sometimes we have to study for our exams. Sometimes we have to be really diligent at work to get a promotion. Sometimes we have to be lucky meaning a lot of good causes and conditions work in our favor. We might decide to go for a hill walk or something like that. Well, you know what? The weather better be okay. You could be unlucky with your weather. You know, the day you picked, it rained. You were depending on a lot of causes and conditions to come together for us to have nice weather. And some of those causes and conditions are quite beyond our control, but we have to work with nature. You know, you'll find it very, very helpful to understand that water flows down a hill. You, if you're at the bottom of a hill and you're wondering, like, well, I'd really like water at the top of the hill, well, you're going to have to put a pump or something in place to get it up the hill. You're going to have to do something that goes against the nature as such, or you're going to have to work with one nature to oppose another way, nature. I started to learn a lot about this as a child. I like seesaws. When I would visit my aunt, there was a seesaw nearby, 
and I wanted to seesaw with my younger brother. He was smaller and lighter than me. So I would have to sit closer to the middle of the seesaw, right? And he would sit further out, and we would balance each other. So this is learning about causes and conditions. Or sometimes we would have to work together to get the, the roundabout moving, because one of us alone didn't have the strength. Or sometimes we would have to play together to push a swing. I would take my turn and he would take his so that we could work together and enjoy the benefits. Later on in life I've learned to see when kids or adults didn't have the same causes and conditions that I did and didn't see the world in the same way that I did. When I was a kid we used to play with bubbles, put the washing liquid into the water and then for fun we would just force the water, you know, at high speed jet the water and then blow up all the bubbles all over the place. It's kind of playful and then throw the bubbles at each other. Recently I was filling a spray pack up in the monastery. We were spraying weeds. So I said to the person, put the water hose under the water when it's filling. I don't want too much foam. But the person didn't know how to do that. So they foamed all over the place. We had foam everywhere, except this time it was spray. So it's not nice. It's not stuff that you throw at each other like fun and kids. But I reflected that this person had never played with bubbles as a child. He didn't understand the physics of bubbles. And I was trying to think, where did I learn that? And I learned it as a child, when it was fun and play and creativity. See, it's a lot of very important lessons we learn as children playing on swings, we learn about the pendulum. Riding on a seesaw, you learn about fulcrums and forces, radius. You can learn all about the, the physics of it later on in life. And you never know where all these like fundamental forces and understandings of nature start to come into effect. Like later on when we're trying to spray some weeds and we can't fill the spray packs because we keep on foaming up the whole place and we get this kind of contaminant all over the place. It's very tricky because somebody never played with bubbles as a child. The same thing with this meditation. It's a different kind of physics, you might say. It's, it's what we call Dhamma. Dhamma is kind of like physics. You can say it's truth. It's the way the nature is. There's winds blowing in our heart. There are forces blowing in our heart. And many of us are ignorant of those forces. We don't study the forces that are blowing in our heart. We don't know why I'm experiencing the effects. So sometimes we get into magical thinking. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky and I'm really special because I'm, I'm born into a wealthy family and everything I want, I have no issue having it and getting it. We don't really see that there was a cause and condition for that. It's magical thinking to think that it was because I'm special. So I acknowledge that I am unique, wonderful, and special, but I am also interbeing, interconnected, interar. I'm not alone in the world. I, I depend on my relationships. So as young children, we, we, are in we are dependent. We depend on our parents very, very much for their care, for them to look after ourselves. When we get older, we're independent. You can see it in the teenagers. They start to develop a greater and greater independence. Into the young adults, they're independent. But then as we get older again and more mature in our thinking and experience, we realize that to achieve the goals we want in the world, we need to work with others. I'm not a very good plumber. I'm not very good at fixing computers. Well, I need to work with plumbers, and I need to work with people who understand the computers or whatever it is, I need to work with the knee surgeons. Whatever it is, we have all these different specialities. Because in detail, none of us can be the experts. None of us can be the voice box expert, or the singing expert, or the carpentry expert, or whatever it is in the world. But by working together, by having good relations, by having functional relations between self and the world, 
we can have a very successful, prosperous life. And we work with nature, the nature of the material world and the nature of the heart. So the more and more that we look into the nature of the heart, the more and more we know the heart, the more and more wisdom will grow and the more and more this world is just as it is. And our model of the world is in accordance with reality. Our mind becomes closer and closer to Dhamma, to truth, to the way the world is. And so that we see that things are the way they are. And they are the way they are because of causes and conditions. And if we have great skill, we can adjust those causes and conditions to our benefit or to the benefit of those around us or to our detriment. So we call these forces wholesome and unwholesome forces, skillful and unskillful forces. So it's not luck in the sense of magical thinking, things that are, have no causes having an effect. No cause is no effect. Effect means there was a cause. Sometimes we don't know what the cause is in detail, or sometimes there are so many factors into the causes and conditions. It's a, what they would call very, very complex. Like the weather system, the climate is a very, very complicated system. We all contribute to the weather. Every one of us in this room contribute to the weather. Your car coming here today contributes to the weather, as does the two billion other cars in this planet. Collectively, the two billion cars are influencing the planet. Collectively, our choices as a species of humanity, 7.3 billion of us, affect the planet. And it's not like I, as an individual human, have nothing to do with that. I do, and I experience the consequences. But I also need to know what I'm responsible for, and what I can do, and what I can't do. So I also need to know the measure of my involvement, and what I can do, and what I can't do. And to the degree that I'm off the line on my reality is to the degree of my delusion. And the more deluded I am, the more suffering there is. Because I'll be constantly thinking, why is this like that? And not knowing the causes and conditions and out of control and not able to manage my situation. This is where it's very delusional and where delusion really impacts the world. And of all the kind of health problems to have, I really feel that mental health problems are the worst because they're really continuous and prolonged and they're a great suffering. But we don't often pay great attention to our mental health and well-being. We're happy to brush our teeth once or twice or three times a day, but we're not often happy to look into our own heart and understand its nature, its causes and conditions. We don't even know how to know the heart. We don't have methods. We don't have tools to help us. We would never walk into a bare shell of a house and expect ourselves to live happily there or just stand out in the field and expect ourselves to be, you know, I mean, if you see homeless people, they're in great physical difficulty. But why do we do this to our heart? Why, why don't we develop skillfulness in our heart? This is a great mystery and it's a great poverty to not know the nature of the heart, to not know how to know the nature of the heart is a great ignorance. So you can see how when a Buddha arises in the world that they are a great cause for happiness and welfare of all beings in the world across the whole universe. Because they share the light of wisdom. I recently checked, I tried to find out how many, how many faculties of universities in the world were studying wisdom. There's very, very few. There's very few people, very few researchers on wisdom. I think all of us in the room would agree that wisdom is something useful, right? Anybody want to be foolish? The opposite to wisdom, right? Foolish? Or as Forrest Gump would say, stupid is as stupid does, right? Anybody want to be stupid is or stupid does? 
No, we'd all like to be wise for some reason, but we don't even bother to study it at universities or research centers. Very interesting. But yet, Buddhism is a path of wisdom. The Buddha was onto it. So we have two and a half thousand years of a path of wisdom, a middle way. So you'll find that people who are practitioners of this are putting in awareness, they're putting in Dhamma Vijaya, investigation into the nature, especially of the heart, and they're putting in a heroic effort. And they're experiencing the effects such as joy, calm and peace, sukha, tranquility, stability of the mind, samadhi, and upeka, this equanimity of mind, equipoise, equibalance of mind. So one of the aspects of the meditation we were doing earlier on is where we sort of, we look back on the whole world. So it's called over, oversight or overview, developing a big perspective of the world. Apparently when the astronauts go up into space, this is one of the great experiences. Almost no astronaut can come back and view the world in the same way. Apparently it's quite, it's, it's very difficult for astronauts like uh, Russians and and American astronauts to view themselves as Russians and Americans. They view themselves as cosmonauts. They view themselves as earthlings. Their whole perspective has shifted. But many of us sitting here in this room can cultivate this idea, this sense, this overview that we are interbeing, we are inter are, we are interconnected and yet appreciate that we are all so unique, wonderful, and special, this paradox. And wisdom, you will always find, is full of paradoxical thinking, apparent contradictions. How can I be unique, and how can I be interbeing, interconnected, inter are? How can I be responsible, and yet part of this 7.3 billion population? How can I be a car driver, and part of the 2 million of cars? And I'm part of the problem, and I own a small part of the problem, and we are this very complicated world, things emerge from the system. So this body is a whole group of different things working together and this body I call, it's a system. And this mind is a system. All these different mental components, different things, anger, greed, hatred, delusion, loving kindness, compassion, equanimity, sympathetic joy, generosity, all these different factors, all working together. And I can have wholesome factors and unwholesome factors. I can have a healthy body and an unhealthy body depending on my behavior. I can have a healthy mind and an unhealthy mind depending on my behavior, depending on the causes and conditions that I'm putting in place, I will experience the effects. But I don't have absolute control. I'm not a creator. I don't have an ultimate authority. The more we look into these aspects you can just see how things are just working together and just like the weather we don't have control over the weather we can have influence as a species but as an individual we have very little influence just like the little kid with the lottery ticket has very little influence over the whole lottery right one ticket in millions of tickets but still potential to win So this Dhamma is a very interesting phenomena. We need to expose our mind to it more and more. And it's something wonderful. And yet it is something, as my teacher once said, it is something very strange and very mysterious and beautiful and awe-inspiring. So I encourage you all to know the heart. By knowing the heart, I mean bhavana. But also bhavana is dependent on other conditions like sila. And sila and bhavana are also dependent on dana. So as we interbeing and inter are and interconnected, we need to be generous with each other. As the Nobel laureate proved, Amrita Sen, I like his work very much. No famine was existed without, the cause of every famine was always lack of distribution, lack of sharing. And I just read on Friday night, I was reading about a young girl in England and uh, she had 
her parents and family had been having a conversation in a car about how a friend who had died had been a donor of their organs and this 13 year old had been touched by this story and decided that she too would become a donor and signed up to become an organ donor and she journaled about it and journaled about her thinking how she saw that this was something skillful and useful unfortunately for this girl she had an aneurysm part of the veins or arteries in the brain erupted and she died but she was otherwise very healthy so because she was an organ donor and her family understood and knew that that was her intention they donated her body so from her one body they were able to they used the word harvest but they were able to donate eight to eight different recipients her kidneys went to two people her heart the most difficult organ for her family to give went to a recipient her lungs went to a recipient her liver was split in two and sent to two different recipients because she was a child she could donate to other children so she became a super donor eight of her organs or eight eight recipients but there's another Nobel Prize winner that I also like, a Scottish person. I think he's called Agnes Dayton. And he did some very useful work that they apply in donations now. So supposing I wish to donate to my brother a kidney, but I'm not an exact match. Back in the old days, that was meant that my brother couldn't get a donation, right? And I couldn't be a donor. But suppose I still wish to be a donor these days because of this Nobel laureates work we can look in the whole population we can look in Australia 22 million people maybe there's a match in the 22 million people and as we know in a migrant population like Australia it's very hard for us to match each other right maybe we're from Ireland so I need maybe in the population of Irish people is a better match for me so if we have a database and we can share these matching I can match up with other Irish people, the four million people back in Ireland, or the five million of them that live in London, or like in Sri Lanka, you have 80,000 Sri Lankans here, but you can also match back to Sri Lanka, 22 million people. Or maybe it's got nothing to do with your, your uh, racial or ethnic background. It can just be some genetic factors, but we can match it up. So instead of me donating to my brother, I donate to somebody else and their family member donates to somebody else and that somebody else donates to somebody else but eventually it comes back that somebody donates to my brother because they're matching through this whole system of pairing up donors so if somebody walks in off the street and said I'd like to donate a kidney this can trigger off in fact the donations of up to 30 40 or 50 donations it can create an avalanche or cascade of donation so the headline news was that eight donations happened with that one child but in reality because of these kind of shared networking effects that happen in fact there was a greater number of donations occurring all around that two kidneys were not two donations because of the shared networking because of interbeing, inter our interconnectedness that exists. Because of the sharing, because of the wisdom, because of the intelligence, a great number of people benefited. So I hope you can draw similarities to the nature of the mind. What the Buddha did was extraordinary. He developed an insight into the nature of the mind kidneys are very important but I assure you the mind is even vastly more important and it is assuredly even more mysterious than any of these very complicated things that exist in our own body so his achievement was tremendous two and a half thousand years we're still benefiting from his donation of knowledge 
his example. It still inspires my own practice. So I didn't have the opportunity to see or experience the Buddha in this life. But I can see and experience the qualities of mind that he talked about. So this practice today that we've been practicing is a kind of focus on this interbeing, interconnectedness, inter R, this relationality that we call community. But you can also see that its taste is very anatta, meaning it is not some sort of super controlling, but this interconnectedness, this fragile connection that exists between all of us, but yet is some of the most powerful things that exist. So dana is a form of connection. Sila, or morality, is a form of connection with the world. And also this knowing the heart, my own heart and the heart of others, is a form of connection with the world. And by this knowledge and wisdom, we can understand the causes and conditions and with this understanding and insight into the causes and conditions, we have better, better outcomes, better effects. We enjoy the better effects. And this prosperity is something that the Buddha wished for all of us, that we be happy and prosperous in body, in speech, and in mind, and ultimately free from all suffering. So this is a true path of liberation, a momentary path, a path of liberation in daily life, and an ultimate path, a, a path and a liberation out of all suffering, out of samsara. So it's been my privilege to have this opportunity to speak to you today and share with you these beautiful teachings of the Buddha. And um, I invite you all to join in the offering of food. And later on, we're having a nice sutta class, which will be on uh, the new satis, six new satis, or six reflections. I wanted to give a framework of why I teach the way I teach, and. Uh, this sutta embraces that kind of an idea, and um, I'm very grateful for your support of the Sangha. Because when you make offerings to me, you're not making them to me, you're making it to the community of monks. And we interbeing, inter are, and interconnect all the way back to the Buddha. So thank you very much, and we'll just pay our respects to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. <laughs>